Heavenly Father, thank you for this gathering of your people. Lord, we want to learn uh, together more about you. We worship you and love you because you loved us first, because you came to earth and showed us how to live. And Lord, we're excited uh, every time that we can gather because we get to practice what it means to love one another. We get to learn more about you because you say grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, in our time together, we pray that you'll make it valuable. We pray your Holy Spirit will be speaking to each one of our hearts and minds and lives. Lord, is there some decision that you want us to make? Is there something you want us to start doing that we're not doing that we should be doing? Is there something that we're doing we should not and you want us to stop? God, is there somebody you want us to talk to? Lord, whatever that looks like, Lord, speak to us during this time of the message. And we pray, Lord, that we'll have that uh, attitude that little Samuel had, that when you call us, we'll say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. We'd be doers of the word. So bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're starting a new series this weekend. It's called The Good Fight. You see that uh, guy with the fist? There is such a thing. Uh, some people would even say maybe pacifists would, uh, would say, well, what does Christianity have to do with fighting? I thought the Christian faith was, was all about peace and love and harmony and crowning thy good with brotherhood. Uh, from sea to shining sea. I mean, that, that's all true and that's all good, but there are times when God is uh, moving in our lives. There's times when we're either in a local church or you're in a country or a community, and we live in a place where, of course, not everybody agrees, where there's conflict, there's fighting, there's, there's people that just don't get along. There's other people that want to dominate and take over other people, and we have to put a stop to it. And I understand that about less than two weeks away, we're going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of what is called D-Day, which was June 6, 1944, when the Allies got together under General Eisenhower, and they crossed the English Channel, and they invaded uh, the beaches of Normandy, France and many soldiers gave their lives tragically to uh, upend the Axis powers in Nazi Germany and their totalitarian domination of the world. And we save, you know, at that time we were saving the world for freedom and for democracy, and that was a good thing. But freedom wasn't free, and it came at a price, and uh, it cost people a lot. And there is such a thing as something worth fighting for. And Timothy, it, this letter that we're going to go over, you're going to see that there are some things that are worth fighting for. There's some things that are good fights. Now, let me say something, thing, let me share some things that I don't think are worth fighting for. And I mean like fighting for. I don't mean arguing. I don't mean disagreeing in a conversational way respectfully. I'm talking about fighting and hating and spewing venom at each other and, and stuff like that. Because in America, even more so today than in my lifetime of low these many uh, 40 plus years. I didn't say 40 and how many, I just said 40 plus years. Um, we live in a world full of opinions ever since the elections, especially during the election season of 2016. We have a bunch of Americans with strong political opinions, and they're very strong and vocal opinions that fill the ranks of both liberals and conservatives. They uh, fill the voices of progressives and libertarians and, and all sides of, of the political spectrum. They all seem to be very convinced that they are in the right. And that means that the other side is in the wrong. And of course, what happens when you feel that you're right and other people are wrong? You know, it's not just a matter of saying, well, you have an opinion and I have an opinion and uh, I respect your right to believe what you want to believe, and you, I, I hope that you'll respect my right. But we don't seem to be practicing that very well, because whoever doesn't believe what we believe is somehow termed as evil and now in need of being silenced or destroyed. And that's sad, because that's not the way America was supposed to be. I remember one time I was, uh, we came back from London, where we had done a whole summer of Muslim evangelism. And I decided, like, you know what? If they can go to Hyde Park in London and, and have these open-air debates, Christians and Muslims in the middle of London, England, and they can do it in a peaceful way on a Sunday afternoon, then I can take a table and represent the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I can go onto the 
uh, campus of Cal State Fullerton, and I can put up a table and put out literature and try to evangelize Muslims and win them over to the Christian faith. And uh, I lasted out there you know, a month or so, and finally some people complained about what I was doing, and I got hauled into the provost or the dean of students office or something like that, and they basically told me that I could not do what I was doing anymore. I, I wasn't a student on campus. I had no real right to be there. And I said, well, you have people all over this campus that are selling stuff all the time, and they are pro proclaiming political views all the time, and you allow them in. And sort of, they sort of put me in a religious category, and they said, you're, you're going to have to stop doing what you're doing. And, and my argument to them was this. I said, I thought that this was a university. Of course, they don't reply to that because they're not going to agree with you on anything. Is this not a university? And they wouldn't even agree to that. <laughs> And I said, but in a university, I thought the idea of university was you take all of these ideas and philosophies and knowledge and learning about the world and you all come together and you talk about them and you debate them and you figure out who, which ideas are the best, which philosophies are the best. And I was convinced that in the court of public opinion, in the realm of public opinion, if everybody gets a chance to speak, I thought the Christian faith is going to do just fine. And they would not allow it to continue anymore, and they shut me down. And it was sad because I wasn't allowed to uh, share what I really believed was most important. Now, that's, that's in the area of politics. I was talking in the area of religion. Here's the difference. The difference between politics and religion is if you believe in the minimum wage or you don't believe in the minimum wage, somebody's eternal destiny is not in the balance. So do you see where I'm going? The difference between like political discussions and talking about faith in the, in the Christian faith and when somebody says, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by, except through me, those are the words of Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 14. Whether you believe it or not, that's up to you, but those are his words. And he's, I think Jesus is implying that your eternal destiny depends on how you respond to a message like that. So when we're talking about the Christian faith, it's not, just it's not just on the same level as any opinion out there whatsoever. You're talking about the difference between life and death. It was, it was really important to the Apostle Paul. I remember the Apostle Paul one time as if you ever go to the book of Galatians and you read the opening paragraphs to the book of Galatians, you're going to see a guy who was on fire, breathing uh, and writing from the point of view of a flamethrower, right? So uh, do, we, do we have Galatians? We don't have that Galatians passage. I'm going to read it to you because the Apostle Paul penned this, and he's talking about the difference between what is the true gospel message and what is a different gospel. In other words, there's a true gospel message where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the, of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. So there's the true gospel message, the, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, and he appeared to all these people. There's the true gospel message. And then he says, but there's other people that are going to come along, and they're going to say, you know what? Being a follower of Jesus, it begins with believing all this about Jesus, but then you've got to keep the law of Moses, and then you also have to be circumcised if you're a male. And I can imagine a lot of men going to church that day, you know, pulling up the car and dropping off the wife and kids. And uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to stay out here because if that, if that was what requ was required to be a, a member of the church, you had to be circumcised. That, that's kind of a, a, a tough requirement of membership, you know, anybody on the male side, right? Okay, so I'm going to get past that. Uh, uh, but here's what Paul says in the opening letter to the Galatians. He says, I'm astonished. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ, and now you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Gospel means good news. And if it's Jesus Christ, plus you have to live this way and not do this and do this and fulfill all these religious regulations, and if you don't do all these things, then you're not going to please God and you're not going to be forgiven and go to heaven. That doesn't sound like good news anymore. And Paul says, if you're going to add to the gospel with all these other requirements, that's not the gospel anymore. That's a different message. And Paul says, that's no gospel at all. He says, apparently, some people are throwing you into confusion, and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, somebody comes along with a different message than what Paul, the apostle, preached to them. They come along with a different message. Let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel, Paul even says, even if an angel comes down from heaven and preaches to you a message about Christ that is different from what we preach to you, let that person, even an angel, be under God's curse, eternally condemned, anathema in the Greek. As we've already said, if anyone's preaching to you a different gospel than what you just accepted, let them be under God's curse. Paul felt pretty strongly about all this stuff. And Paul, to Paul, the careful communication of the good news about Jesus was so important that if he saw anyone changing or twisting or distorting that message, Paul saw that person as someone to reject, someone to warn other people about, somebody to say, watch out for that guy because he doesn't have the truth of the gospel. He's perverting and twisting the, the true message about Christ. Paul calls this false teaching a different gospel. He says it's no gospel at all. Don't follow it. And if you're changing the message about Jesus, if you're saying there's other ways or beliefs that other than faith in Christ in order to get to God, besides faith in Christ alone, then you are preaching a perversion of the gospel. Now, I say that as an introduction to 1 Timothy because when you get into the first chapter of Timothy, we're only going to cover verses 1 to 11 today. But Timothy is being warned about these false teachers who are taking the true gospel and they're twisting it around and they're changing it. And they're saying, I got something else to talk to you about other than Jesus. And Paul says, watch out for that. So go back to that slide about Paul, just so you can learn a little bit about him if you don't know much about him. Paul wasn't born Paul. Paul was born with the first name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus, right? He's the son of a Pharisees. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. He's, a, he's like a blue-blooded Jewish person, uh, educated in Jerusalem by Gamaliel, who was one of the greatest Jewish teachers of his day. He became a fanatic for the Jewish faith. When, and when Saul was a younger man, he saw the Christian faith springing up, and he said, this is wrong. Jesus, in, in Saul's uh, point of view, Jesus is not the Messiah. He didn't bring in the kingdom of God. He didn't kick out the Romans. He died on a cross. Some people say he was raised from the dead. I didn't see him. So he didn't believe it at all. And he tried to stamp out this new sect of Judaism that was called the way. Paul tried to put an end to the Christian faith in the first five years of its existence. Now Paul and now Saul is on the way to Damascus to rest and imprison other Christians, and he has an encounter where he says he saw the light, and the light was Christ, and he, they said, who are you persecuting, and, and who are you, Lord? You say, I'm persecuting me. Who are you? And Jesus says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, of whom you are persecuting. And Saul had an instant conversion in his life, and he realized, whatever I believed before, I was wrong. I now believe in Jesus. Now I'm following him. Now I'm going to take that message, and I'm going to be the principal mouthpiece of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So Paul goes all over the Roman world. He was a great missionary in first century uh, Roman Empire. He goes all around all the major cities in the Roman Empire and preaches the gospel, plants churches, and he comes to the end of his life, and he's imprisoned for a second time in Rome. But right before he gets to that imprisonment in Rome, he writes a letter to his protege, to one of his assistants, to one of his co-missionaries that had been with him on lots of these journeys before. He was probably a middle-aged man by now. His name was Timothy, right? So Paul leaves Timothy in the city of Ephesus over in western Turkey on the eastern side of the Aegean Sea. You know, a couple, 300 miles east of Athens, right? So there's this big city of Ephesus. Do we have a, do we have a picture of the city of Ephesus? Somewhere in here. There's, uh, if you ever take a tour, if you ever take one of those uh, cruises around the Mediterranean world, some of them stop in the city of Ephesus. Uh, I had a guy, Jerry Lauer, we, we used to teach this membership class at our church. He would always uh, show the class these photos that he took while he was uh, a tourist in Ephesus. And he used it because in the city of Ephesus, that by the way, this is a picture of the amphitheater, which sat 25,000 people in the city. But Jerry would always show this picture of this 
platform area, and he would say this was one of the earliest churches that was in Ephesus, and then he would show this kind of hole in the ground or this carved out place in the ground, and it, it had steps going down into it from both sides. It was about three or four feet deep, and everybody's wondering, he says, what do you think this is? What do you think this is? And finally, somebody in the back goes, it looks like a baptistry. And Jerry says, exactly, that's what it was. It was a baptistry in the early church of Ephesus. And of course, then he took off from that. It was his big starting point to say, do you see how you had to walk down into the water in order to be baptized? The baptism is by immersion. It's not by sprinkling. That was his big point that he made from the city of Ephesus. Okay, back to the, so Paul is this awesome missionary problems in the city of Ephesus in the church. He leaves this young man there named Timothy. What do we know about Timothy, right? His name, Timotheos. Theos is that Greek word where we get theology, God. And so Timotheos in Greek means one who honors God, right? Timothy was a young man. He grew up in the city of Lystra, which is right in the middle of Turkey. During Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey, Timothy was a young man in that church. I believe that Timothy converted to become a follower of Christ during Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey through that area. They, they preached the gospel. They planted churches. There was a brand new church there in Lystra. A couple of years later, Paul says, hey, let's go back, Barnabas, let's go back and visit those churches that we started back in the day. And Paul and Barnabas had a separate uh, going of their ways. So Paul takes this other guy named Silas, and they start revisiting the churches and they get to Lystra and in Acts chapter 16, they see that this young man, Timothy, had not only converted to the Christian faith, but he was growing leaps and bounds. He was probably devouring the word of God, growing like crazy, respected by all the people in the community. And Paul says, hmm, maybe we ought to ask this guy to join our missionary team, which I thought was very interesting. Like, do you remember the last young man that Paul had on their missionary team? on the first missionary journey, this guy who halfway through the missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, he says, I think I'm pretty homesick and I don't like these Gentiles and I can't eat their food and I'm getting sick and I'm catching bugs that I didn't know even existed in Israel. So this young man named John Mark, he gets on a ship and he goes back to Israel. He leaves the missionary team about halfway through. And as Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to go back on their second journey, Barnabas says, let's take Mark with us again. And Paul, hard charging Paul says, the guy's a quitter. He's a loser. We're not taking him. And Barnabas says, well, I still believe in him. I'll take him and I'll go that way. You go that way, Paul. And I have to think, this is, this is what some commentator brought up. And in 40 years of study, I never saw this before. He said, you kind of wonder if after Paul broke up with Barnabas because of John Mark, that as Paul and Silas are now on the second missionary journey and they're traveling along, if the Holy Spirit isn't convicting Paul and saying, you know what? You can't quit on people, Paul. You got to give them a second chance. Nobody's perfect. Nobody charges and is as hard driven as you are. You got to have some grace with people. You can't give up. In fact, Paul, you're going to die, and there's going to be another generation that comes after you. And Paul, they're going to have to carry on the gospel that you're starting right here. You're planting all these churches, but you're going to die. Who's going to lead these churches after you're gone? And Paul's like, mm -hmm, you yeah, know, yeah. grump probably, probably had a hard time processing all this stuff. And finally, in humility and repentance, I think Paul says, okay, okay, you're right. I, we, I can't give up on people like Mark. And later on in Paul's life, he welcomes Mark, and Mark ends up writing the gospel of Mark. So all's well that ends well with Mark. But now Paul is saying, I, I gave up on that young man. I got to find a new guy. I, I need to find a, you, a, new, <laughs> a new young man that I can groom for ministry. And Paul found this guy, Timothy, and he says, Timothy, we're going on some grand adventures out there, and they're going to be dangerous, and it's going to be exciting, and you're going to see God do some amazing things in people's lives. Do you want to come? And Timothy is like, yeah, so let's go. And it's very interesting, and I challenge you to do this. Go through all the letters that Paul wrote to all the churches and all the individuals and try to do a search and look for Timothy's name. You can find Timothy in just about every one of the letters that Paul wrote, which means that Timothy was with Paul all the time from the time of Paul's second missionary journey. 
20 years go by, and now Paul's writing him this letter. So here we go. This letter's from Paul. Back to the verse, please. You had it right the first time. Here we go. There he is. Uh, this letter's from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God our Savior. When you read that, the command of God our Savior, were you thinking Jesus right there? Because I was. Oh, God our Savior must be talking about Jesus. No, God our Savior and Christ Jesus who gives us hope. So when you think about, that's the first time, by the way, in the New Testament where they mention this phrase, God our Savior. And it sort of reminds me that Paul, in 20 years of thinking theology, finally said, you know what? Jesus was sent by the Father to become the Savior of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So God really had our salvation in mind for, for millennia, ever since the creation of man and the fall of man, that he knew he was going to send Jesus. So who's the ultimate author of salvation? It's God. So he says, God, our Savior. I'm writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. That true son isn't, isn't the idea that Timothy, biologically, I'm your father, you know, because Timothy already had a father. He's not his biological father. He's sort of like a, his spiritual father. But he says, my true son, meaning my genuine son in the faith, my legitimate son in the faith. Timothy, as I've raised you up in Christ, as I've, I've raised you up to be a leader and a world changer and a difference maker in your own generation, Timothy, I couldn't be prouder of you. And I couldn't think of anybody else that I would rather leave in this city to do the work that I'm calling you to do. Because Paul was good. he was a traveling missionary and he was moving on. Timothy, you got to stay in Ephesus. There's some things you need to straighten out. So let's go to the next verse. Okay, so Ephesus seemed to have this particular problem. I'll, I've called it out before. I'll say it again. The biggest problem in Ephesus right now was false teaching. False teaching. Interesting that five years earlier, on the beaches of Miletus, Paul had called the Ephesian elders for one last meeting together. And you can read about it in Acts chapter 20. And he says, you know, I, I want you to shepherd the church of God of which the Holy Spirit has made, has made you overseers. I want you to watch out for the flock because you know what? Eph Ephesian elders, someday, and, I, and the Holy Spirit is telling me in the future in Ephesus, there are gonna be false teachers that are come in and Paul calls them savage wolves. That's how strongly Paul feels about these false teachers. And he says, these guys are going to come in like savage wolves and they're going to try to devour the flock with their false teaching. So somehow this false teaching was going on in Ephesus and Timothy is being told by Paul, we've got a problem, Timothy, and you've got to straighten it out. This mention of myths and endless genealogies, there's this complex and esoteric heresy that's going on in Ephesus. It was a mistaken application of Judaism. There's these guys that are studying the Old Testament. They're getting all kinds of crazy ideas. Oh, let's study the genealogies. Oh, well, let's study this philosophy. Oh, let's study these stories and try to make a figurative application out of a physical historical story. You know, that's called allegory. And the, and the church followed along and they messed up so many times doing that. Paul adds later, their teaching wasn't just misguided, right? So now it's not just innocent people that are sort of going the wrong way, but they didn't know any better. It wasn't just misguided human speculation. They were, according to 1 Timothy 4, Paul says, you got to watch out for these guys because they were following doctrines of demons, right? They were following deceiving spirits and things taught by demons, Meaning that in this world of spiritual warfare that we live in with God on one side and Satan on the other and mankind caught in the middle and the angels pulling for us and the demons pulling against us, that there would be people that would be influenced by demons to teach false doctrine into the church and introduce heresy into the church. Saying, hell, you say it's just faith in Christ alone? That's what saves you? Ha! Ha! Well, we say it's faith in Christ plus this. Or we say, well, you don't even need to believe in Jesus. You need just to live your lifestyle like this. And when that false teaching comes in, Paul says, there is a major problem. You remember, we read the Galatian letter, how strongly Paul felt against these guys. These guys, are they need to be eternally condemned if they bring a false gospel like that. So now Paul's saying, Timothy, I'm leaving you there. You've got to straighten it out. You've got to take care of these false teachers. Right? When I left for Macedonia, this is verses 3 and 4. 
When I left for Macedonia, Timothy, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations. They don't really help people live a life of faith in God. So they're teaching false doctrines. They're teaching Jewish myths. They're wanting to be teachers of the Old Testament law. By the way, when you take your average Bible and you take about the first three-fourths of it, that's the Old Testament. Those are the Hebrew scriptures. They were compiled over about a thousand year period, maybe even 2,000 years from Genesis all the way down to Malachi. Maybe a thousand years collecting these 39 books of what we call the Old Testament. And there are people who had no Jewish background, weren't raised in the synagogue or anything. They were trying to become teachers of this body of learning. And Paul, who was dyed in the wool Pharisaic Jew, who was taught at the feet of one of the greatest Jewish teachers ever, Gamaliel, he says, I know the Old Testament. And whatever they're teaching right there, that ain't it. That's not it. They're they are messing it up and they're introducing heresy into the church. So Paul says, Timothy, let's get things straight. When you get down to verse five, this is what they're doing wrong. I got to tell you what you need to do right. And so he says, the purpose of my instruction, Timothy, is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. Timothy, if love isn't your goal, if love isn't your motive, you, you, you got to recheck your motives. It all has to be done in love. You need to have a pure heart. You need to have a clean conscience. And you need to have genuine faith. And when you don't see that in yourself, you need to repent and confess it. When you don't see it in other people, you need to correct and rebuke and challenge them and get them back on the right track. Because there's basically, when you read the, the letter of Timothy, Paul's letter to 1 Timothy, right? We're going to be over this the entire summer. So I, I, I'm just going to say, hey, might be good if you read it. I, I went on BibleGateway.com. You can listen to the letter of Paul to Timothy in 12 minutes. So don't tell, oh, you're asking a lot of me, Pastor. You know, the whole book of First Timothy, that's a lot to study. No, you can listen to it in 12 minutes if you want to, if you don't like reading like 80% of men. Unfortunately, that's why all the Christian books are written for women. <laughs> Sidebar comment, yeah. Now most, okay, so... Here's Paul writing to Timothy, writing about heresy, false doctrines, Jewish myths, people who want to be teachers of Old Testament law, but they don't know what they're talking about. Get back to the proper teaching. Christ, here it is, threefold message to the churches. This is in Timothy. Number one, Christ is revealed from heaven and salvation is accomplished by him and through faith in him, right? Pretty simple. That's foundational gospel Christian teaching, right? He died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, and he was seen by his followers, right? Basic gospel message. Christ is revealed from heaven. Number two, what is the church? When we gather together on Sundays, what are we supposed to be doing? The church is obligated to teach and to preach this message and to live a life in a way that points people to the truth of the gospel message. So what does that mean? We need to live our lives in a way that points people to the truth of the gospel message. That means that in order for the church to function right, this church, every church needs godly leadership, men and women who practice and teach ethical and moral integrity. I go back to Acts chapter one. In my former book, Theophilus, Luke is writing uh, book number two, sequel to the gospel of Luke. And Luke says in my former book, I wrote to you all about what Jesus began to do and teach, right? Jesus always did it before he taught it. He's, he's like, what was Troy talking about earlier? Troy's talking about the hardness of heart. And how does Jesus reveal the hardness of heart of men and women who would not believe that he was the Messiah? He, there's, he's teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Oh, you can't do anything on the Sabbath. Keep it holy, right? What does it say in, by the way, just, Old Testament law. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Keep it set apart unto God. It, it says, you shall do no work on the Sabbath. Okay? There's what Moses' words, that's what he said. 
So what do the Jews do over the next 1400 years? They figure out all the various details of what it means to work on the Sabbath and then to say, and you can't do that either, right? So you can't do this, can't do that, can't do, you can't do anything on the Sabbath. So Jesus comes along and he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are like, what? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Our job is to keep the law of God, and we've already figured out the umpteen ways you can't do any work on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, well, is it okay if I heal somebody on the Sabbath? And, and you know what the Pharisees, do you know what the teachers of the law responded to Jesus? Is it okay if I heal somebody on the Sabbath? Just because it's a Saturday, does that mean I can't heal somebody? And the Pharisees said, six days there are in the week to do healing, but you're not to do anything on the Sabbath. So here's this guy with this shriveled up hand. And Jesus says, uh, no, I'm, that, you've misinterpreted what it means to keep the fourth commandment about keeping the Sabbath. So Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath. He takes a shriveled up hand, arthritic or rheum, rheumatic, whatever it was that the guy was suffering from. He heals it. The man has a beautiful hand now. It's fully formed, functioning. The man is joyful. He's ecstatic. He's rejoicing. He's like, praise to God in heaven, which, by the way, isn't that what we're supposed to do in a worship service? All praise to God in heaven. And the Pharisees react to the miracle that Jesus did on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And they said they went out and they started plotting how they were going to kill him. Right? That's pretty bad. That's called distorting the message of God. And that's what was happening. So we got to have godly leadership who not only know what the truth of the gospel is, that they got to live the truth and practice it so that the gospel doesn't get discredited to say, well, I see the way you're preaching, but I also see over here the way you're living. And I don't really care about your message if your living is such a disconnect between what you say you believe and what you actually live. So we got to have integrity moral and ethical integrity from the leadership of our church. In fact, Timothy's full of this. You want to be an elder in the church? Here's some rules you got to live by. One of them was to be uh, uh, the husband of one wife or to be a one-woman man. By the way, this, uh, this is another sidebar. Lisa's giving me this. You're going down another rabbit trail, but I just got to share this one thing with you. Because in 1 Timothy 3, when you got to be a one-woman man to be a leader in the church, to be an elder, what, what they were saying was, well, wait a minute, was there ever a prohibition against polygamy in the Old Testament? And the answer is no. There was no law against marrying more than one woman in the Old Testament. But so how did it change? I mean, did Jesus ever come along and say, uh, in order to be a Christ follower, you can only be married to one person? No, Jesus never said that. But what they did do was when they came across uh, uh, qualifications for somebody who was going to be a leader in the church, they said, you need to be married to one person only. And that's how it started. And I, I remember asking my missionary friend, Sherman Pemberton, because he, he was in Zimbabwe. He was in a different part of Zimbabwe than the Chittimoyo Hospital. So he was down further south. But he said when they'd come across these tribes and there was polygamy all over those tribes, when they came and, and they'd preach the gospel and they told them that Jesus was their savior and they need to follow him and these these uh, Shona people would start following Jesus. Uh, I, I said, so what did you do with, all, with these men who had multiple wives? And he said, we didn't do anything. And I said, I thought you guys were Christians. You let these guys go on with multiple wives? And he says, he says what we did was we said, look, we're going to have leaders in our church. And we're going to have people that are qualified to be leaders in all these local congregations. And guess what? You can't be a leader in our church if you're married to, to multiple wives. And that's how they started the change. That's how they started the change in the New Testament. You want to be an elder? You got to be the husband of one wife. All right, let's go back to this. So uh, Paul's trying to straighten out the false teaching. He's warning about the heretical teachers. He's telling Timothy, you're going to have to fight. Timothy, you're going to have to fight a good fight, but you got to fight the good fight like a Christian. You can't, you know, have any low blows. You can't have any rabbit punches. You can't have any knees to the groin because that's not according to the rules, right? You got to fight the good fight in a way to speak the truth in love. So where, what happens? How are you going to tell a false teacher? How are you going to tell somebody who gets off track spiritually, right? When a person gets off track spiritually, Paul begins in verse 6. He says, some people have missed the whole point. They've turned away from these things. They're spending their time in meaningless discussions. Believe me, I've been in a lot of 
A lot of conversations that at the end of the day, I said, boy, that qualifies for 1 Timothy 1.6. Meaningless discussion. They, they want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't even know what they're talking about, even though they speak so confidently. So Paul says, Paul says these guys, they, they want to focus on all this Old Testament stuff. They want to focus on the Jewish lines of genealogy and what that means for following Christ today. That has nothing to do with following Christ today. In fact, that's why, in, that's why the, our Bible is divided into two main sections. That's why we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Because the Old Testament means Old Covenant. That means the agreement that God had with the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... And with the Jewish people, God had a covenant with them, and that was his agreement with them for how to follow God. Jesus comes along, and he initiates a new covenant, and the new covenant is not just with the people who are sons of Abraham. The new covenant is anyone, you're in covenant with God in the new covenant if you are in Christ. Anybody who's in Christ is a new creation. Anybody who's in Christ is in the new covenant with God. And I think what Paul probably would say was why are you focusing on all these details and discussions about stuff that's in the old covenant where if you're 90% of the church here in Ephesus, you're a Gentile, you're nine out of 10 people in this church are Gentiles, they weren't even part of that covenant. So why are you going back there and talking about how all these rules apply to you today when you weren't even part of that covenant that's now obsolete and fading away because the new covenant is here in Christ? I, I think Paul would have some of that argument uh, in, in the church at that time. So what? These people are uh, spending their time in meaningless discussions, thinking they're teachers in the law of Moses. They're conceited. They're argumentative. The talk didn't amount to anything. It was foolish. It would, they're, they're teaching from ignorance. They were teaching ascetic practices. You know, you can't do this. You can't eat that. You can't marry they were uh, arrogant. Uh, their attitude was bad, right? Now Paul shifts over to the Old Testament. He says, okay, they're spending all their time in the Old Testament. Let me tell you what the Old Testament was for. Why did God give us the law in the first place, right? So now he goes on to verses 8 and 9, and he says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Why is the law given? Well, the law is given, be, uh, Paul says, because of transgression. The law is given to us to point out that, you know what, you think, you think you're living an okay life, you think you're right with God, uh, but here's the commandments. Are you breaking any of these commandments? Oops, you know, am I lying? Am I being disrespectful? Am I lusting? Am I stealing? Am I robbing? Am I coveting? Am I envious, jealous? All these things as you go down the list of the commandments, you say, you know what, I am. So what does the law do? The law shows you like a mirror that you and I are law breakers that we are sinners, and that sin separates us from a holy God. That sin tells us through the law that we are not in a right relationship with God and that we need God's forgiveness and grace in order to get there, and that's why Jesus came. So we need to run toward Jesus and embrace him to get into a right relationship with God. So the law points us to Jesus. Right? We know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and the rebels, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy, the irreligious. If you think I use a lot of adjectives, look at the Apostle Paul. He just used six to describe them. Lawbreakers, rebels, ungodly, sinful, unholy, irreligious. And now what do these, what do these guys do? What, what's, what it, go to the next verse. What is it that they do that... that, that outlines specifically what the sins are. It says the law is for people who are sexually immoral, those who practice homosexuality, those who are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching or what we would call in some translations what is translated the sound doctrine. Anything that contradicts the sound doctrine that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by the blessed God. So these guys want to focus on the Old Testament. The Old Testament was for the lawbreakers. The Old Testament was supposed to point us to Jesus by saying you're a lawbreaker and you can't save yourself and you can't forgive yourself and you can't do enough good things in your life to make up for the bad things that you've done. So instead of trying to perform your way into approval with God, why don't you go in the way that God made for you in the pathway of faith 
and trust in Jesus Christ. And so Paul's always pointing people back to Jesus. And he says, let's go back to the good news because that's where the wholesome teaching comes from. That's where you don't get messed up. Paul's talking about meaningless genealogies. He's talking about endless discussions of Old Testament law that don't, uh, fables and myths don't lead anywhere. They don't help anybody. I can remember, I'll tell you a quick story. Hope International University, this is back in 19, I don't know, and I was a student there, and that's where I met Lisa, and she was really young at the time, and I must have been a kid too. But she convinced me. She said, you want to be a missionary? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, well, at Cal State Fullerton, do, do they have any degrees to be a missionary? I'm like, no, but I, I bet you know a school that has one. And, and she's like, yeah, because I, I got her sarcasm, and I kind of liked it. So um, she persuades me to go over to Hope International University, and I'm, a, and I'm a missions major. So now I'm a full-time Christian college student. So I ride my bike down every day to Hope International University, and I take my classes, and I spend the rest of the time in the library, become a library rat. Tried to convince my daughter to do it. She, she didn't embrace that lifestyle at all when she was at Hope. But I did, and I'm living there, and, and I'm meeting all these, these scholars, what I thought were scholars, all these Bible college students that are scholars. And they're, they're meeting in the library, and then they're getting together for coffee in different places on campus, and they're having all these discussions. And I can remember, I remember the first day I went to class, and it was a great class uh, taught about the basic Christian faith. And the professor gets up and he says, students, um, if you never come back to school, if you never come back to this school, I at least want to give you this truth so you'll know what the Christian faith is all about. And I'm leaning in like, wow, man, this is going to be awesome. One, one day, one class, he's going to give it to us. And he says, I'll tell you what the Christian faith is. Once you put your faith and trust in Jesus, here is how you're supposed to live the Christian life. You've got two things you need to do to live the Christian life. And he goes up on the chalkboard, and yes, I said chalkboard, a real green chalkboard with white chalk. Lisette, you don't know what I'm talking about, but it, it, it existed back in the dark ages. That's how people wrote stuff up on the board. So he writes it up here, and he goes, he says, here's the two, the two steps that you need to do to live a, a proper, successful, faithful Christian life. Number one, you need to, number one, become like Christ. You need to become like Christ. Become like Christ. What does that mean? Well, start thinking the way Jesus thinks. Live the way Jesus lived. Uh, feel the way Jesus feels. Act the way Jesus is. Look how Jesus treated people. Look how he loved his neighbor as himself. Look how he forgave people who were mean to him and all this stuff. Become like Christ. So there's number one. I say, like, okay, I got it. I, I can't live it yet, but I, I understand the concept. Number one. Number two your step to be a faithful follower of Jesus is you need to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. And I go, wow, that's a big phrase, ministry of reconciliation. Well, it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it basically says God was in the world reconciling or making peace with the world, with the humans in the world. God was in the world reconciling the world to himself through Christ, and he has committed to us the message and the ministry of reconciliation. That's another way of saying the Great Commission, right? Now, I, I say that, I hesitate when I say Great Commission because I just read a Barna study that said there are half the people in the churches today, if you say, what is the Great Commission, they don't know what that is. I'll give you a hint. If I ask you what the Great Commission is, please don't respond and say, oh, I don't know, 8 10%. That's a different commission. That's not what we're talking about here. The Great Commission is go and make disciples of all nations, right? Jesus at the end of Matthew's gospel. He's leaving the earth. He's ascending into heaven. And he says, what do you, what do you need to do, guys? Go and make disciples of all nations, right? Baptize them. Teach them everything that I've commanded you. I'll be with you always. My Holy Spirit's going to be with you. He's going to be with you. He's going to dwell in you. You're going to have all the power you need and you're gonna be my witnesses, right? So that's the Great Commission. So become like Christ and be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. Puts the chalk down and he says, class discussion over, have a nice day. So we leave, and I'm like, I think I got it. So now I go in the, I, now I go in the library and there's all these Bible scholars and they're having these discussions and I'm, I'm a knowledge junkie. You guys know that about me. I don't listen to music on the radio. I listen to talk radio. Why? Because I want to learn stuff. I don't want to just, whatever. 
So, uh, so I do that, and I'm, I'm sponging this stuff in, all this Christian knowledge, and I'm listening to these guys talk and talk and talk, and, they're, and they're mainly, their main topic of discussion was the end times, the book of Revelation, Bible prophecy, uh, when is Jesus going to return, how he's going to return, what are, the, what are the signs of his return, uh, is it going to be premillennial, is it going to be postmillennial, is it going to be a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation, a post-tribulation rapture, what are the signs in the earth that are going to be hours and hours, over and over and over, and, I, and believe me, the first couple times I was with these guys, and I'm listening to them, and they're spouting scriptures at each other, and they're talking about this event in the world, and I was fascinated by it. But I'm keeping my first lecture in mind, too. And somewhere during the discussion, I just got turned off and I walked away. And the reason I walked away was because I knew that these guys were not involved in their local churches. I knew that these guys were not out there trying to make disciples. They would rather sit among themselves and discuss the, their, their latest opinions about what the signs of the times are before the return of Christ. And, and it finally dawned on me, and he says, you know what Jesus said? He said, go and do business in the gospel until I come back. That's what he said, right? So whether he comes back mid-trib, post-trib, pre-trib, post-millennial, pre-millennial, that's up to Jesus. He says, you're not going to know the days of the times anyway. You're not going to know them. Only my father knows. So I'm not going to know all those details be busy becoming like Christ and be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. Get busy doing that and you'll be okay for his return. And I walked away and what, what it dawned on me was when I'm, now that I'm reading this first chapter of Timothy is like, that's what I was experiencing. I'm experiencing these endless discussions, these opinions going back and forth that are going nowhere, that don't mean anything, that don't save anybody, that don't really inspire anybody to live a better life. They're just like talking to win an argument. And I was like, I'm sorry, I, if that's what you wanna focus on, do your thing, but I'm not gonna be part of it. And, and I was like, I can't do it. I, I, th I think you're not focusing on the main thing anymore. I think you're just a bunch of Christians getting together about arguing about how Jesus would return instead of going out and sharing the good news with people who are outside God's family who desperately need to be brought into God's family by hearing and responding to the good news message of Christ. So that's, I think, what was most important. I think Paul was like, hey, the mission of the gospel is too important to get caught up in these ridiculous, endless, meaningless discussions. And if you see that going on in the church, Timothy, as my apostolic delegate to the churches in Ephesus, Timothy, you need to put a stop to it. You need to just correct, rebuke, encourage, but do it in a way that uh, still loves your neighbor as yourself, right? Still loves your neighbor as yourself. So let's come down to the end. I want to talk to you because some of you guys have your bulletins. Some of you guys have been wetting your tongue on your pen, waiting to write in those words, and you can't get the words yet. Well, here are the words. There's not too many of them, but they're at the end. This was, this was what are we supposed to do today? We're going down to the end of it, Greg, down to, the, down to one of the last slides, and says, and says, so how do you and I, how do you and I imitate Paul and Timothy today? What do we, if we're going to, if we're going to be like the Apostle Paul's talking to us as a church and saying, church, how do you do the right thing in your church when you get together? What's the right thing to do? What's the wrong thing to do? Number one, we are to teach the standard of truth, what we call sound doctrine, wholesome teaching. We have to constantly be teaching the standard of truth. We need to learn it. We need to study it. We need to know it. So when the false comes along, we already know what the true is. We know that's a counterfeit and we reject it. We don't get caught up. We don't start majoring in the minors. We don't start getting involved in meaningless uh, rabbit trail activities, discussions, whatever, that don't advance the cause of the gospel. So teach the standard of truth, number one. Number two, it's not just what we say, it's how we live. So practice a good life of integrity. Live what you say. I think Paul would say to, the, to these teachers, these false teachers, he'd say something like, oh, so you think you have the right doctrine and beliefs about Jesus? Well, that's great. But how are you living? I want you to live what you believe. I want you to live a life that is so consecrated to God that 
that you will become like they, like when Paul says, if you're going to elect somebody to be an elder in the church, you need to live a life consecrated to God so that you are, quote, blameless in the culture. So they look at you and they don't see it something that is so glaringly offensive in your character that they don't want to believe the message about the gospel. So practice a good life of integrity. Live what you say. And then finally, Timothy, this Christian life, I'm sorry, you want a life of peace? You want to go be a monk in a monastery somewhere, cloistered away from the evil dark world? No, Timothy, you can't do that. You got to stay in the city. You got to fight for the city. You got to fight for the people in the city. You need to fight the good fight of faith. But here's how you do it. You have to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. You can't browbeat them. You can't, you can't belittle them. You can't insult them. You have to treat them with love and respect, but you have to correct and rebuke and encourage with all sincerity and don't give up. And Timothy, when you do that, you're going to be a good soldier. You're going to be a good minister of the gospel. And that's what we have to do in the church today. I'm going to ask the worship team, John, April and Raul and the gang. Is there anybody else? Is this the, this is the Kingston Trio? Okay, and you guys are going to come up and sing a final song. I want to close with this. It says, we're supposed to speak the truth in love in the church today. We're supposed to teach what the true gospel is and reject anything that's a false gospel. So just a reminder, what are we saying when we say what's the true gospel? I want to put it in a nutshell. Here's the truth according to the gospel. God is love. And God created everything that is in the world today, including mankind. In fact, God created mankind separate in a way from the rest of the world. We're still part of the world, but he created us separately because he created us in his own image. And that means we have the ability to love, to reason, to create. We have the ability to make moral choices. And God is going to hold us accountable for the choices that we make. Mankind, instead of accepting God's provision and authority in our lives, mankind, we rebelled against his authority, we sinned, we went our own way, and that sin separates us from a holy God. But you know, here's what's so awesome about God. God loves us too much to leave us separated from him. And so God, in his love, he sent his son Jesus. He made a way for us to be forgiven through Jesus. Jesus gave his own life for us on the cross God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we could be made right in God's sight through him. So how do you get right with God? You make a decision. You, you hear the good news message, you believe the message, and you decide to commit your life to follow Jesus Christ. If you do that, he promises that he'll forgive you and he'll save you and he'll bring him to be with you to be that you will be with him forever in a place that he's been preparing for 2,000 years called heaven. That's a wonderful place. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to call on the name of the Lord? Because that's how you're going to get in. That's how you go from being outside God's family to crossing over and becoming in God's family. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Thank you for loving us so much that you would give up the glory of heaven, that you'd come down humbly, become a poor, itinerant laborer, and then a, a preacher walking around without a home to call your own here on earth so that you could show us who God is, so that you could live a life of holiness, so we would know how to live a life in imitation of you, and then you would give your life as a substitute payment for us when you died on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for, for the, the, the option that we have. Thank you that you give us the ability to make a choice to follow you. And Lord, today, as we understand who you are, and we, we're realizing who we are if we would put our trust in you and what we could become. God, we, we choose to follow you today. We believe in you today. And you said whoever does that will cross over from death to life. And so, Lord, from, from a place of ignorance, Lord, now that we know who you are, we embrace you, Lord Jesus, and we're going to follow you all the days of our life. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the privilege of being forever in your family from this day forward. 
Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us first. Show us how to follow you in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.